Middle East War of June of 1967 caused major changes to the maps, the people, and the governments in the Middle East. The early morning of June 5th exploded the surprise attack of the Israeli Air Force on the Egyptian airplanes on the ground. 80% of the Egyptian Air Force was destroyed. By June 7th, Israel had destroyed the air forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. They had control of the Sinai Peninsula, Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza. On June 8th, the USS Liberty, America's most sophisticated intelligence ship in 1967, was attacked by Israeli air and naval forces in international waters, 13 miles off of El Arish in Sinai. 34 Americans were killed. 172 were wounded. The Israeli and American governments pronounced the attack as a case of mistaken identity. Issy Rehar was the chief of Israeli naval operations. He reported a ship had shelled the port city of El Arish. So I think around 12 o'clock I decided to order three uh, MTBs, motor torpedo boats, from the port of Ashdod. Are you sure you can't see any kind of an identification? And all the words came back, no. If you will be sure that it is a military ship, you can hit it. The first Mirage pilot radioed, oil is spilling out into the water. Another added, great, wonderful, she's burning, she's burning. And El Arish commander reported, he's hit her a lot, there's an oil slick in the water. Then headquarters asked, Menachem, is he screwing her? The next wave was super mysteries with thousand pound bombs and canisters of jelly gasoline. Someone in southern command called, he's going down low with napalm all the time. The flight leader noted, it would be a blessing if we could have iron bombs. Otherwise, our Navy's going to get here and do the sinking. A pilot interrupted, pay attention. The ship's markings are Charlie Tango Romeo 5. There's no flag on her. And headquarters ordered, leave her. The time now is 14.12, and he says, I see CTR-5. And the minute we hear that, the Air Force stops all operations and says, all our aircraft, all our attack aircraft, please stop. I must say that at that point in time, in my mind, it was an American ship. But that opinion was not shared by the commander of the torpedo boat squadron. He believed it to be a small Egyptian freighter, the El Qasir. We told him uh, there are some doubts about identification. These doubts incredibly did not reach the commanding officer who ordered the torpedoes launched. That the order did not reach the commanding officer on the bridge where you launched the torpedoes. At about the range of uh, 1,000 yards or a little bit more than 1,000 yards, I ordered to prepare the torpedoes and uh, ordered that uh, uh, all commanders will take the uh, action of uh, firing torpedoes. This is the story of the attack on the Liberty told by Israeli and U.S. government sources. Now, we are going to show you what really happened. The survivors of the 294-man crew of the USS Liberty will tell you their story. I'm Tito Howard, the producer of The Loss of Liberty. The host for this program about the attack on the USS Liberty will be Dr. Richard Kiefer, one of the many heroes that day. Dr. Kiefer was the only doctor aboard Liberty. He had a gunshot wound, he had a burn, he had a broken right kneecap, and he had 11 pieces of shrapnel in his abdomen, which he kept together with a life jacket. That man stood on those legs for 28 consecutive hours saving American lives and limbs. This film should shock decent Americans. Above all, men and women who served in America's armed forces, it will shock particularly as it was an attack not by terrorists implacably opposed to the United States, as is the case of the USS Cole. The Liberty is the most decorated ship in the history of the United States Navy. 840 medals, including the Medal of Honor for her skipper, the Presidential Unit Citation for her crew, two Navy Crosses, 
11 silver stars and 204 purple hearts. The, the day before, I, I was topside when, I, when Israeli planes came by and very close where we could, we could wave to the pilots and they were that close where we could wave back. It was a very clear day. It was a warm day. Sunshine was shining brightly out. Um, nice breeze blowing. And I distinctly remember hearing the flag flapping in the wind. There was approximately 13 sorties of our ship from 6 o'clock till 12 o'clock in the afternoon. We had a general quarters drill that lasted uh, 45 minutes or so. Our captain, uh, like me being an engineer, really believed in watertight integrity and making sure our people were equipped and knew how to fight fires and repair damage. I was coming to go back to the Trescom area. I stepped out on deck. That plane came by and looked right in the cockpit. He waved, I waved. That's how close they were, and they knew where they were. Well, all the recon flights uh, that they had that morning were looking at our ship for approximately six to seven hours. They had a good idea of what they were doing, and uh, they hit they hit us hard and fast with everything they had. Commander William McGonagall, the ship's captain. Although he had been badly wounded, most of his bridge crew had been killed. He stayed on the bridge throughout the attack and the long night that followed. Admired and respected by his crew, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor for gallantry. When the plane struck, it was without provocation and certainly unexpected. And they seemed to descend on us from all directions at the same time. Those rockets and machine guns tore the ship. It killed men on deck. And we were defenseless. I heard this big bang, and there was bullet holes all behind in the cushions of the couch that I just left. And by the time I got to the door of the ward room, the skipper was on the PA system that we were under attack by unknown forces, man your battle stations. Then the regular general quarter sound alarm went off, and right across the hatch from the ward room is where I would go through, down through decks to my station. When I went through there, there was one rocket that came through and helped me to get down two floors in a dad burn hurry. When I got up off my knees down there, well, we were well under attack. And uh, the skipper again was on the uh, phone system telling uh, auxiliary radio to get word out to anyone that they could that we were under attack by unknown forces and we were in the need of help. My reporter station uh, was Radio Central. It was my responsibility to keep up you know, ship to ship or ship to shore communications. And uh, out on deck in Radio Central, we were taking rounds through the bulkheads. There was a two 55-gallon drums of gasoline just outside the bulkhead on the 01 level that had caught fire from the strafing run. And that was uh, heating that outside bulkhead and peeling the paint off on the inside. There was a lot of smoke in the compartment. There's holes where we were taking rounds where the sunlight shining through, and it was a real surrealistic look. I was topside fighting fires and doing other damage control work throughout the duration of the attack. At the same time, I was able to observe the jets flying overhead, and I also observed the American flag flying from the mast. At no time did that flag hang limp from the mast. I was one of the two signalmen on uh, the USS Liberty uh, when the ship was attacked, and uh, my only job uh, during the attack was to make sure that, uh, that the flag was flying, so uh, every few minutes I would walk out at the signal bridge up at the mast and fighting what fire we could with what little water I could give the people topside for the fire, uh, it was really a problem. So that on the first pass, they knocked out our, in our ability to call for help. The one remaining antenna, which I had shut down because it had some problems in the tuner, is probably why it didn't get hit. I had to jury-rig a you know, coaxial cable directly from the transmitter to the antenna. So we were working feverishly to try to get a signal out uh, at that time, and then finally there was uh, we were able to get a signal to the Sixth Fleet, and then they, I was listening or monitoring that uh, communications, and they said that they would be sending aircraft, and so 
At that point, we just felt overjoyed that knowing that there was going to be aircraft coming to our rescue.